after the resurrection, believers and those who are seeking to believe and perhaps those who require to be here because their family and friends were believers assembled on Sundays to worship God, to learn a little bit more about him and to offer prayers and offerings. As a result, each church kind of adopts, unfortunately, if you will, sometimes the personality of the pastor and will have its organization of the worship service based on his or the deacons or whomever is in leadership, what they would like to do. So I'll give you a little clues into our worship. Almost never, I can never say never, but almost never will we have the offering after I preach. Because I've been impacted by those who are on TV ministries and others who seem all that they care about is the money. And so I um, am mindful of the joke that you've all heard, but I'm going to tell it anyway, about the little boy who is sent to church for the first time by himself uh, because his parents didn't go, but his parents thought it's a good idea for the child to get a religious education. So they gave him a quarter to place in the offering plate. And so he went to church and did put the quarter in the offering plate and came home. And his mother said, well, what did you think about church? And he said, I thought it was a pretty good show for a quarter. And a lot of people, that's kind of what they come to church with expectations, that the worship be a certain way and that they pick certain songs or hymns or whatever that they like uh, and that if it met their need, then it was a good time for whatever and um, little care about what we're supposed to be doing. And so um, I usually wait till after the offering to do that. Well, usually we don't throw the offering the first thing, because let's face it, we've had experience. Half of you aren't here if we started off with the offering. And so the offering would be even less if we started it. So we've got a place at some place. And so I can't do it at the end of the service, and so we don't do it at the beginning. So it kind of comes after the worship time. Now, I know that there are pastors, for instance, who would rather preach right after the worship because then you've had the most energy and you're hopefully enthusiastic and you're singing, and so you're most likely to pay attention. Whereas in the offertory, it's usually a little more contemplative. The music is great, but it's a little more, and you're sitting there, and it's easier for you to just... Uh. So I have to spend a little more energy to get you to pay attention. Um, and so that's what we do. However, that's not like what it was prior to the resurrection. The Jews were required to do certain things. They would, on a weekly basis, go to synagogue, which would kind of be like our church, except in the synagogue they'd have men on one side and women on the other, and the women were supposed to just be quiet and do things. And in the New Testament church, we let women do all kinds of other things. But they were required to go three times a year to Jerusalem, all the men, to worship at the temple. And Passover was one of those times when the men were required to be there. Now, Passover was a remembrance that was to be personal, that God had delivered Israel from slavery into freedom and that he walked with them daily, giving them manna and water and sustained them. And the entire 40 years that they were in the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't, things, God did miraculous things. But it was a remembrance of a time when God passed over and there was blood on the door. So there was a sense of redemption. And you were required to come to Passover not empty-handed, you were come and you were to offer a lamb which was to be sacrificed and then you were to eat that lamb that evening 
and do the Passover Seder, which our church has done several times throughout our uh, history. And so this is such a time that Jesus is coming to the first Passover in his ministry. Now, as the scriptures and as we showed, it was his custom along with his family every year to go to Jerusalem, the entire family for Passover. Some people, because what Jesus does at this time is similar to what he does at his last Passover. And they think the two are the same. And I believe that the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry are bookend by the cleansing of the temple. So I believe that it's two separate events and it takes place at the beginning of it. We're also told that Jesus was about 30 years old when he started his ministry. So in John chapter 2, starting with verse 13, it says this, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem was placed upon mountains, so you always go up. We have a tendency, up means north and down means south. No, going up to Jerusalem means you're going from a lower uh, geographic place to a higher geographic place, which makes sense because it's the capital, but it's where the temple is erected. I had the opportunity to go to different places uh, in Greece and in Rome and others, and I discovered something that I had never really realized prior to that, other than looking at, yeah, we go up to Jerusalem, that each of these cities and towns, when they would have their God that they would worship, they would place a, the temple to the primary God on the highest hill so that every time you walked around in the town, you could see the temple that the God was dedicated to. So for instance, if you go to Athens, you will see the Parthenon and, and this great structure that you can see from wherever because it was going to make it obvious that this city, this town, worshiped that particular God. And so temples were generally placed on the highest point. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and money changers were seated at their tables. Now we read that, and we just go on. But I want you to use your, mem your, your uh, imagination, not to create things that, that aren't, but to understand things that are. See, we generally live in the city, very clean, antiseptic thing. We don't think about oxen and sheep and doves. So I just want to assist you. How many of you have gone, you don't, you don't have to raise your hand, and seen a parade where there are horses? Those horses, as they go along the parade, do things that people have to come and clean up afterwards. And they're smelly, and it's dirty. See, you see the image that's projected here? These animals are placed in the temple area. It's not antiseptic. It's smelly, and it's dirty. But the reason they're there is to make a profit. You see, each person, each man who came to Jerusalem was required to bring an offering of a sacrifice, which was an animal. So if you live, for instance, in Greece, you are unlikely to bring a sheep with you because the sheep was to be with, without blemish or spot. And in the trip, something could happen to it making your offering worthless. So you usually brought other things in order to purchase the sheep as an offering. Also, when you presented an offering at the temple, you couldn't just use any old 
money. You could not use the common money for exchange, the denarius, or anything like that, the Roman money. You had to use the shekel, the temple money. So you had those who were exchanging your Roman currency for the temple currency. And they did that at an obscene profit. They also, if you were fortunate enough to live close and bring your own animal, they had inspectors to make sure that your offering was without spot and blemish. And it was in their interest to disqualify your offering so that you would have to purchase another one. So it wasn't that there was just business going on. It was a corrupt business. And so as a result of this, it says in verse 15, And he, being Jesus, made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. You see, Jesus took this personal Because this place is not just where you go to worship. It is his father's house. The last time we saw Jesus being at the temple, he was having theological discussions with those in his father's house. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as to your authority for doing these things? Now I want you to see this. Their question, their argument with Jesus, isn't that Jesus isn't right. They're not saying, well, wait a minute. It's necessary to have these money changers and these people who are doing the inspections and to do the business. They're not arguing that it's necessary. Their argument is, What authority do you have to tell us it's wrong? They question his authority when he said, this is my father's house. He already told them what authority. He's the son of God. It's his father's house. And Jesus answered them. And notice he doesn't say, again, it's my father's house. I'm the son of God. Because in reality... All they ever seek is a sign, a miracle. So he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews misunderstand his statement, and they say, the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. Now, unfortunately, with language, It doesn't oftentimes communicate to us body language. We don't know, but I suspect that when Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up, he wasn't pointing this way. If anything, he was pointing this way. But when you don't want to understand, you intentionally don't understand. And so they change, well, wait a minute. And Jesus' ultimate sign is his death, burial, and resurrection. So he says, you want to know what authority I have? The resurrection. Now John helps us out. And in verse 21 he says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing, But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he need not, because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew 
what was in man. He's telling this, John in his gospel is telling us that Jesus knows two things. One, he knows in the heart of man. So he's God. Although to a large extent, you don't have to be God to know that people are just no good. It's, it's surprising not how bad people are, but how good they are. But notice it says that Jesus, and he uses a different word, it says people believed in him, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. The same word entrust is the same word as believe. The people believed in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in the people. Well, why would Jesus not do that? Because the people at this point believe that, yeah, he's probably the Messiah. But they don't understand what kind of Messiah he is. They're looking for the guy who's going to kick Rome out and to establish a new kingdom, and he's going, not yet. I came to be a suffering servant. I came to serve, not to be served. So they are trusting and believing in a concept that isn't what Jesus is at this time, which is no different than we are today. A lot of people, not all, but a lot of people who claim to be atheists are really not atheists. They're just mad at God. Because God did or didn't do something they thought that God should have or shouldn't have done. Some terrible thing happened in their life, and if God was good, God wouldn't have allowed that bad thing to happen, and therefore there can't be a God, and they go on because they're upset with God. Or they hear people say, you know, if you just believe and speak and whatever, these things will happen. Or if you just give to this particular ministry, all kinds of miracles are going to happen, and they don't, and therefore there must not be a God. The problem is people believe in the wrong God. They believe in a Santa Claus God. Or they believe in a boyfriend or girlfriend God. Or they believe in, um, I just love you so much you can do whatever the heck you want to do, God. And that ain't God. God is God. And so a lot of times people will believe in a God that doesn't exist, and they get mad at a God that doesn't exist and say that he doesn't exist because he never did. So Jesus knows what's in the heart of people. And just because you claim to believe doesn't mean that you do. Now in this teaching, unfortunately, where most pastors will go with this is a talk about business and church. And so I'll talk about business and church because that's what you're going to expect. There are certain geographical areas, it used to be in the south, where we used to call it the Bible Belt, that it was somewhat in your financial interest to go to church because that's where the other people were and you made contacts and you could then develop because, hey, I'm a believer, you're a believer, so do business with me. You need to sell your house. I'm a real estate agent. And so you, you go to church because it's in your economic interest to do so. I was accused of, of attending this church back before I was the pastor for that reason. And I never th- quite was sure whether to be more upset because they questioned my character or they questioned my intelligence. You say, why would you question your intelligence? Because if I were going to pick a church to do business, it would probably be like Episcopalian because they have all the money. The church I attend, I don't think they're, well, by the world standards, we're rich. But by America's standards, we're just middle class, so lower middle class. You don't need a lawyer most of the time. Go on legal Zoom and do whatever you're going to do. So I, I, I always thought it was interesting, the accusation. And so we get so worried, so we don't know whether we should sell Girl Scout cookies 
in church or not because we don't want to do business in church. And we're so worried about that, we make all of these things. And so some churches will say, okay, well, as long as it's not in the sanctuary, it's okay. You can do it in the foyer. And others will say, no, you need to do it out in the uh, parking lot or something or, or whatever because we don't want to do business in church. Well, there's a more serious teaching. It has nothing to do with this building. See, Jesus was talking about his father's house and the temple. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. We spend so much time worrying about whether we're going to sell Girl Scout cookies in church. We ignore the fact that we are the temple of God, and what in the heck is happening with our bodies? Are we representing God as a temple of God, as, a hot, as being on a hill, proclaiming that I believe Jesus is the Son of God and that his spirit dwells in me and I gladly proclaim that and that I am a light on that hill, proclaiming it to all of mankind and that yes, I am not perfect and yes, I sin and yes, I do those things, but my Father dwells in me. And because of that, I am holy. I am not holy because who I am. I am holy because who dwells in me. And it's not Joe. And in case Paul thought, and you thought that Paul stuttered, in the same book, at chapter 6, he says this. And he goes... And he's talking about how we are to treat our bodies and how we are to refrain from sin within our bodies. And he will again in verse 19 say, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body. So it's not only what we don't do, we are to refrain from sin and to be holy, but we're to do more than that. We are to glorify God in our body. It's not as a matter of, okay, I'll do nothing. I'll sit here and I won't, and I won't do anything to, to dirty up the, the body of the Lord, but that's not all. We are to glorify Him in our body, which is more then just say, praise the Lord. It is who we are. It is what we do. It is what we say. So I'm going to ask a really tough question. It's Passover. People are showing up to the temple, your temple. And Jesus comes to your temple. Does he need to get a cord and do some serious cleaning? Or does he say, well done, my father's house is being used for the purposes it was intended. Now if you're honest and I'm honest, there are parts of our lives that need cleaning. And the awesome thing is, we have a God who's willing to do so gently and lovingly. But if we're His and we don't, then He'll do what's necessary to clean His Father's house. For you are a temple of God. And each of us 
united in love and unity and purpose, assemble ourselves as another temple that we call a church. For you see, this building we have dedicated to worship him and to praise him and to give offerings to him and to teach about him and to minister for him. But this ain't church. It's a building. You and me are church. And the awesome thing is, it doesn't matter how big church is. Because it says where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is, which means church. So again, today's message would be simple and would be, okay, I can't remember the last time we sold something in the sanctuary or in the foyer, so apparently we're at no danger. But when we come to understand that God dwells in us and that we are the temple of God, it needs to impact who we are and what we do. They asked, what authority do you have to do this? His response to our cleaning is the same. It's my father's house. And he has already shown us that he destroyed the temple in three days and rose it again. He's not only shown his authority and given his authority, he has demonstrated it to us. So we no longer need to ask, well, why should I clean up my temple? Because he's God and you're not. I know that's a shock. I know the next time you take a selfie, you'll feel because the universe isn't about you. It's about him. And even your body is not about you. It's about him. So the next time you take a selfie, say, I want to take a beautiful picture of the temple of God. And that As beautiful as it is on the outside, it is even more clean and beautiful on the inside. And all God's people said,